Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. Um, this is a series of webinars organised by our Ipsos team in Switzerland. We hope it will be an interesting and useful session with some practical tips that you can take back to your teams and a greater appreciation of why good UX is so important and what makes the difference between design success and design failure. So this is our team today. Um, myself and Damien manage the UX business across Europe and beyond. We have UX teams and hubs in Asia Pacific, in Japan, South Korea, in Southeast Asia, in LATAM, in the USA, in UK, Germany, France, Rus Russia, Switzerland, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I have spent the last 23 years working in research agencies in Asia, Europe and LATAM. So I've spent my career helping clients to understand users and placing human beings at the heart of decision making. So hopefully helping some of the best companies in the world to make their products useful, usable and accessible. Damien brings 20 years of experience in UX, working with a variety of companies and industries ranging from finance, healthcare, media and transportation. He ran his own UX agency for more than 10 years, has written a variety um, in a variety of industry publications and he's spoken at UX conferences. Stefan and Hubert, who many of you will know, are based in Switzerland and they will inspire you today with some case studies of how we've worked with clients across different sectors to improve their UX and ultimately their business metrics. Hubert is a senior client director and our call lead in Switzerland and Stefan leads our customer experience and channel performance business in Switzerland. So hopefully we have all of the experts here to be able to answer your questions. So today's session will be about 40 to 45 minutes and we will take questions at the end of the session. So please do put questions in the chat box and we will hopefully have time to answer some of them today. And those we don't get to today, we will make a note of and we will, of course, respond to separately. Um, so today we will look at some of the key areas of UX that can make a difference between the success and failure of a product. We'll give you some insights as to why we need to deliver a compelling user experience and we'll give you some guidelines on how to do this. And by compelling UX, we mean not only minimising friction, but also potentially increasing the delight of users. There's a common phrase we use in UX, which is you are not your users. So I think this is uh, essential to remember. And today we will remind ourselves why it's so important to speak to users. And um, please don't leave us before the end as we have a little uh, gift for you at the end. So firstly, I wanted to define UX as we all have slightly different definitions um, or understanding of what UX covers. Really, everything is designed. So think of every website, every app, every bot, every voice activated device, smart device, car, medical device, etc., that we interact with on a day to day basis. All of these products have been designed by someone with a user in their mind. And our job as UX researchers is to ensure that these end users are embedded into the design process. This is the key thing here. Um, so we focus on two main areas, designing new experiences and improving existing experiences. And obviously, the earlier in the process we speak to users, the likelihood of creating a good product is higher. Moore's law is an observation and proje projection of a historical trend, and it states that processing power doubles every year. We've seen this trend in technological advancement over time, and now, of course, we've seen that that technological advancement has accelerated during the past 18 months fueled by COVID. However, human abilities have pretty much remained the same, so we still can't fly, we still can't read minds, we still can't levitate and our bodies still age, unfortunately. In fact, in the last million years or so, our brains haven't changed that much. So the rate of technological change places a large demand on our ability to cope. Modern life is complicated and we're often in cognitive overload. So this means that any new thing we come into contact with has a high chance of being rejected. So when you launch a new product or service to your customers, there's a chance it won't be received positively. This is quite a, a scary um, statistic. So across Android and Apple in 2020, 218 billion apps were downloaded and only 25% of those were used more than once. That's a 75% rejection rate. Clearly, the majority of apps are not meeting users' needs and later we'll explore some of these reasons why this may be. But UX is not just about digital products. The UX of a website or an app is important, of course, but so is the UX of a device or of a service. As I mentioned previously, everything around you was designed by somebody and for someone to use. A decision was made consciously or not that affects the experience of other people. 
So user experience is about placing humans at the heart of those decisions. It's about recognising and accommodating the stresses and frustra frustrations of daily life. We must design experiences that are easy to understand, um, so to help people achieve their daily goals. So why should we care? Well, of course, there's many reasons to care about UX. In a UK survey we conducted recently, 70% of customers abandon purchases because of bad UX. So poor UX has a really direct impact on a business's top line and bottom line. Um, in the same survey, we saw that over half of users don't engage with companies with a poor UX. When the content is difficult to find or not relevant to them, people just switch off. And people have a choice. They will leave us and they will use an alternative if the UX isn't up to their expectations. And this isn't just for new brands. This applies to all big, loved and trusted brands. So we need to get it right. And ultimately, testing design ideas with users saves us time and money in the long run. For every dollar invested in UX, the return is $100, and developers spend 50% of their time reworking projects because of UX. Hi, so I'm Damien, and I'm going to introduce you to the next part of the uh, webinar. And I'm going to talk to you about a really useful way of thinking about UX. And as Catherine said at the start, I've been doing UX for a long time, in fact, probably since around 1999. And whenever I've needed to explain UX, which has been frequent, I've always returned back to this model. Um, and it was created by somebody called Peter Morville uh, in 2004. And he's a best selling author of some of the foundational books and concepts of UX. So I'm going to take you through each segment of the honeycomb and show how important each one is uh, to delivering a great experience. So the first one we're going to talk about is useful. And essentially, it refers to whether something's helpful in achieving a goal that we might have. So, for example, a vacuum cleaner is useful if our goal is to clean dirt and crumbs off the floor, but not so useful for cleaning liquid off the floor. And in today's competitive world, essentially, this relates to whether a product or service is better than, than the existing solutions out there. And a good example of this on the screen there is Apple. And they launched mapping software in 2012. And their aim was to replace Google Maps as the default mapping tool for iPhone users. And when, when it was first released, it experienced quite a number of issues and people ultimately weren't, didn't find it useful in helping them navigate. And the end result resulted in um, Tim Cook, Apple CEO at the time, um, releasing a public apology, basically stating that it wasn't up to their normal standards. And I think the reason for this ultimately is that they weren't able to offer anything better than Google Maps, which was already first to market. And as a result, 70% um, of users stayed with Google Maps. And interestingly, I, I saw a study recently in 2018 that showed Google still had the majority share with about 67%, Waze had 12% and Apple had 10%. So it's interesting that Apple had never really been able to overcome that problem. And the key point to take away really here is that if you're planning to launch something new, you have to give users an obvious reason to switch. And a great way to do this is to do customer research on what the alternatives already are and make sure that you're offering a better solution to the problem, to a problem that users really, really care about. OK, so the next one I'm going to talk about is desirability and desirable. And ultimately, we're quite hardwired to prefer things that look nice. And there's something called the halo effect, which is a bias that we have where we're more likely to hire somebody or forgive somebody if we find them attractive. So the term is named after the use of halos in historical art to represent kind of purity and goodness. And the halo effect is a, a bias, essentially, that we um, we generate a positive impression about a person or a thing based on its appearance. And when we find somebody attractive or find something attractive, we tend to apply um, that positive impression to other unrelated aspects. So someone who's attractive, for example, we might think them as intelligent and kind and successful. And so we apply other unrelated things to them. And when people have a positive first impression of a website or an app, um, they carry that through the experience and can be a little more forgiving of poor aspects of that experience later on. 
but it can also work the other way around. So if someone has a negative first impression, they're quite likely to then generalize across the entire experience and consider that company in a negative light, meaning that they're probably less forgiving when things don't go so well. So if you, if you look at an example here, so you've got two identical pieces of content, but actually the difference here is in good user interface design principles. Um, and what you can see on the right here is that the design of the content there has got clear spacing between the lines. There's clear white space around the content. The headings and content hierarchy work. Um, they've drawn out the quote to be a bit more easy to, to grasp and understand and draws your eye to it. And they enhance the contact, the contrast between the interactive elements there. So where you're entering your email address and then the button there. And although these are really simple changes, they can have a massive impact. And that really what this kind of means is sometimes the perception of easy to use is as important as it actually being easy to use because it, it drives whether somebody's going to interact or not. And making an experience desirable isn't just about clean and minimal design, it's about creating a connection with the audience too. And this example from MailChimp uh, with the sweaty hand uh, animation is really a clever thing that they do because it communicates not only the importance of what you're about to do, that you're about to send an email to thousands of people, but it also creates that connection, that kind of moment of delight. And they carry this through with other, other animations that just give you that kind of connection to the brand. Um, and this, this approach is obviously very animated and, and uh, driven by personality and may not work for everyone, but I think it's a really nice example. And the key point really to take away here that perceived ease of use is a key component of somebody's intention to use something. And if people aren't engaging with your content, there's a high chance it's because it isn't designed well. OK, so the next one is about accessible. Is the experience inclusive? And ensuring the design is accessible to everyone is really, really critical. And in this example, um, you can see from the Euro 2020s final, um, the image to me looks totally fine. You've got um, one team in blue, one team in white, and the referee in pink. But actually, when you look at this through different eyes, through the eyes of a colorblind uh, person, you can see that actually it's not quite so clear all of a sudden that the referee now looks like he's part of the Italy team. So it's a different story altogether for different people. And Geolingo offer a really nice example of, of inclusive imagery throughout their experience. So they use gender and culture throughout the experience, and they use these lovely characters that are so uh, very diverse, but they make you feel welcome and invited, and they include everybody, which, which creates that really nice positive feeling for, for all. And the key point really here is that we have to ensure that more people can access our products and services. And we've got to be more aware of the impact our decisions make on everyone. So often this means that we need to challenge our biases and ask ourselves who might be excluded from using uh, this thing that we're designing and releasing. So the next one is about credibility and, and trustworthiness. And designing for that is really critical but it can be really hard to pinpoint the difference between a credible website and one that's lacking. And sometimes credibility is achieved through highlighting awards and recognition in, in this um, purple box here, but it often is more subtle than that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you two examples of two different designs. And I want you to imagine you're looking for a tool which can help you manage email marketing campaigns. And you're shopping around, you see two different websites, and I just want you to take a moment and consider which would you choose. So this is option A. I'll just leave that up for a couple of seconds. And then this is option B. So I know I've shown you those really quickly. And you might not have had much time in that example, but in real life, I think you would have spent a lot more, a lot longer. But actually, I would make a bet that your judgment on credibility is made pretty quickly. And I'd also bet that a lot of you chose A. And I think the reason for that 
And I'm just going to call out some of the examples where they've designed for credibility here. So number one on the screen there is they highlight um, the latest iOS update and how it affects email design. So they make the content feel very relevant. It's very helpful for me as a potential customer. And I know that they're always going to be up to date. Number two, they talk about migration, uh, uh, partner resources, all of the kind of things that I would expect from a credible um, software platform. Um, items number three and four talk about a demo. So it's exactly the kind of thing I'd be expecting when interacting with a software platform. Uh, it also shows that they've spent money and time on helping educate their customers about the offer. Number five focuses on getting me sales results, which is obviously what I'm keen on. And number six highlights some key brands. So they've done a good job there to highlight credibility in, in sometimes subtle ways. And the key point to take away here is that trust can be lost really, really quickly, but designing for it can be a little tricky and it must be designed into the experience from the very start. And user research and testing it with users regularly to ensure that trust remains is, is very important. And this is, I guess, even more important in a crowded marketplace. OK, so the next one is about findability. And this is about, you know, we've all experienced frustrating websites and apps and tools where we can't find what we're looking for. And often the search function doesn't help much either. And if you imagine on the CNN website that you wanted to find an article that you've read previously, but you just can't remember where it is or you didn't bookmark it, this sitemap is really terrible in helping you to do that. The, organizer, the organization of the information is by date. So unless you can remember the specific date and year that, that the content was available, you're not gonna have a lot of luck in finding what you're looking for. So it's a good example of a poor information structure. And information is organized in a specific way to suit the experience. So in Netflix, for example, it's designed in a way to facilitate browsing and a very sit back and relax experience, um, which sometimes can be frustrating when you're trying to find something specific. Um, and this example below is from Asana, which is a product management um, software tool. Um, and essentially what they do is they design the navigation in a big mega drop down to help people who are potential customers uh, I isolate what they're looking for, what interests them, and then click through to that and, and find out more information. And then Amazon and Booking.com are completely different in the organization structure. Um, what they do is they're designed to filter out things that, that don't match what you're looking for. So it's a process of elimination, really. And what I wanted to highlight here was that actually easy to find content is no accident. There's a really thorough process and methodology that goes behind this from library science, which is called information architecture. And it's about the labeling and uh, organization hierarchy of information. So the key point really here is that findability is a critical component of the experience. If people can't find what they're looking for, well, they're going to probably leave for a competitor. And the labeling and organization of content is really, really important. Um, so ultimately, we have to do the hard work so users don't have to. And now we come to usable, which is probably what most people would associate with UX. Um, is the experience easy to use, satisfying, effective and efficient? And subtle differences here um, in this example where the layout of the page is, is affected by button placement. And with a bit of eye tracking and good design principles, we can identify what's an easier flow for users to um, scan down the information and click on what they need. And another example of that is in if you imagine long drop down menus trying to find a country can be quite frustrating. And this is a, this is an autocomplete, so a predictive search tool. So it just makes the experience just that little bit easier. And whilst these two examples are quite small and, and minor, when you add them all up, they they combine to make what, what we call an intuitive experience. And they, they can be quite subtle, but that, you know, that as a whole, they can really make the difference. So I'm going to just take you through a couple of examples of where companies didn't deliver on that usable um, part. 
And in this example, Marks and Spencers in the UK launched a new website in 2014. And it was two years in development, cost them a massive 150 million pounds. And at first look, it was great. It really lovely imagery, nice, clean look and feel, felt very credible. But actually under the surface, there were quite a few UX issues, um, difficulties in accessing user accounts and navigation and the tablet experience wasn't great. Product information wasn't always very easy to find and wasn't very useful. And essentially the pro project didn't go through good UX process and led to a drop in conversion and an estimated 55 million loss in sales. And another example from, from e-commerce is Crate and Barrel in the US. And essentially what they did is they placed a registration form in the way of shoppers um, trying to buy products. Lots of assumptions were made um, by the design team and, and were not tested with users. And eventually when the UX team finally did test the experience, they found that it was causing users a lot of problems where repeat customers couldn't remember if they'd registered, new customers just wanted to buy and they didn't want this distraction. And removing this step increased sales by 45% and resulting in 15 million sales in the first month and 300 million over the year. So the key point really here is that easy to use is a very foundational element and customers have very little tolerance when it isn't in place. OK, so the last one I'm going to talk about in the Honeycomb model is arguably the most important. And in this example from eBay, you've got 19 areas of interaction, so 19 different things to attend to or click on um, and interact with. And yet, despite the number of alternatives in the marketplace and the number of companies that try to knock eBay off their perch, the value that eBay offers is huge because despite that poor experience and despite some of the fees that they charge, you know that your item that you want to sell is going to reach a really big audience and there's a huge value to that. And a couple of other examples I wanted to show was, you know, some of these products you've probably never heard of. But if you look at some of the companies there, they're big companies that have spent a lot of money trying to release these products to market. But ultimately, none of them really able were able to offer a strong enough value proposition to users and ultimately failed. So the key takeaway here really is that if the experience isn't valuable use of time and effort, then the other dimensions don't matter so much. So every interaction has to demonstrate real value to users. So I've talked about the model now. Um, and I'm just going to talk about what good UX process looks like. So this is our Ipsos process and it starts with listening and observing users. It starts with discovering needs and identifying where people currently solve their problems and where the gaps might be in that experience. Then we move to ideate and we design and we test those experiences with users and we make sure that we're constantly testing and iterating on, on those ideas before we go to launch and then we monitor how that experience is working for people. And I'm not going to talk about these tools now, but there's a number of different methods that we can use here um, depending on the project. And, and we at Ipsos are working with many clients across different industries. And we ensure that essentially the experiences are as fr frictionless as possible and a delight for users to use. And the key thing here is that we place users at the heart of every design decision. So we involve them every stage and as early as possible. And what makes the UX offer unique is, is not only our ability to run research globally, but it's our ability to bring expertise like behavioral science, semiotics, ethnography, and so on to any project, depending on, on the needs of that project. And as a company, we also run several global trends and future studies, which means that we stay relevant and informed as a UX team on, on any sector that we work on. OK, so now I'm going to hand over to Huber, who's going to talk a little bit more about some of the work that we've been doing. Thank you, Damien, and good afternoon, everyone. So indeed, let me take you briefly through two very inspiring case study, and then my colleague Stefan will do the same uh, right after. 
So the first case is related to the medical sector, as we were partnering in this case with a large pharmaceutical company. So in this case, our client needed to develop and to refine the what we call the IFU, so the instructions for, for use, as well as a quick tip guide for a new device. And the goal was twofold. The first one that, you know, to secure a safe use, but also an efficient use of the device by the users. Uh, ultimately, the end goal of the client was to enrich the, the file they were preparing to submit to the FDA to maximize their chances for, for approval. So what did we do in this case? So we went through a iterative process made of, you know, three rounds of what we call formative testing via in-depth interviews. And each of the round of interviews were performed each time with, you know, different respondents and each time, you know, improving like incrementally the, you know, the various documents that we were uh, testing. The last step, you know, resulted ultimately in very minor modification, meaning that, you know, the, the results were stable and acted almost like as a, as a confidence test. So during this process, uh, you know, just to give you a bit of a feel, we were in a position to, to catch, uh, uh, you know, some mismatch, uh, especially regarding the, the key steps that, you know, patient had to follow through the, the process. And we were able to restructure and reorder the, the instruction of, of use step by step in a much more logical order. We were also in a, in a position to significantly improve the, the layout and design uh, of these instructions, uh, leveraging some very simple, you know, icon or illustrative drawings to reinforce and, and facilitate the instructions uh, for the end users. So at the end, the final output was assessed through what we call like uh, summative testing. And it's in essence la like a, a larger scale test following a very, you know, structured and, and robust protocol uh, through which we assess like, you know, specific tasks. At the end, we could, you know, deliver to our client these uh, final instructions material, uh, including the enhancement I, I mentioned before. Uh, before. And, um, you know, finally, you know, the, the medical device, I mean, the file could be submitted to the FDA and was launched uh, successfully. Um, the second case, if you can move, yes. So the second case refers to an area where we are all heavily exposed. I mean, Katharine uh, mentioned it before. So it's the, the area of the, you know, the apps. Uh, this is also an area for which we, Ipsos, are regularly consulting and conducting, you know, UX research. And as highlighted earlier, many apps are, are launched every day, but, you know, few survive. You know, Katharine mentioned this, you know, 75% rejection rate. So we really, you know, can, you know, bring a lot of value in this area. Um, our client, in this case, a company active in the financial sector, approached us as they wanted to launch a, a new application uh, related to credit uh, application. So, you know, to help people like, uh, you know, get uh, a new credit. So the first step was to design an app for them that could work on mobile, but ultimately could be also extended to other devices like, you know, desktop or, or tablet. And in this case, our client was interested in, you know, I would say examining like a usual elements such as like the screen flow or the ease of navigation, the layout and, and so on. So to help our clients, we, we did run what we call a expert evaluation of the apps. And when we refer to expert evaluation, we are really talking about, you know, having our own, you know, UX design team review the app as a first step. Uh, those experts are, are trained and uh, they are able to identify like pain, pain points or, or, or challenges and uh, they base this on you know very strong you know UX design principle based on, on predefined requirements and, and, and best practices. So this is a way also for us you know when we go to you know to, to, to you know enter into the, the research phase with actual you know respondent to show like you know better uh, finalized prototypes. So then this expert evaluation was followed by um, a set of you know, traditional, I would say, core browsing session to address some of the you know, potential pain points. And uh, at this stage, like various elements uh, and throughout the process were, were refined, including like, uh, you know, enhanced like iconography, but especially in this case, the, the implementation of, um, I would say, a more, you know, sequentially organized and logical flow to avoid, you know, to lose, to, 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 to lose, you know, users throughout the, the process. 
net, we were in a position, you know, to deliver to our client, you know, one integrated design and flow, which ultimately uh, was applicable to, to three devices. So these are the first two case studies, and uh, I'm handing over to Stefan for the next two. The one I would like to, to share with you is also how to implement uh, UX in an agile way. So in this specific case, uh, we were, uh, you know, partnering with a, a client on the telecom industry, uh, and the objective was to redesign uh, the customer service touch points uh, in order to increase the sales uh, and the service goals. Um, so in this specific case, we were uh, tasked with infusing a high level of user feedback on a long period of time uh, to uh, fuel some uh, different type of stakeholders within the client organization, whether it's post-launch product managers, designers, and some others. Uh, so we had, uh, in terms of approach, a dedicated uh, you know, testing team that conducted over 200 tests in, in, in a time period of two years. Uh, these tests were remote, were unmoderated, so very easy way to implement and leaving also freedom in terms of calendar, which was allowing actually to get feedback almost on a daily basis. At the end of each of these print sessions, uh, we had some in-person deep dives in order to dig deeper, uh, you know, uh, some of the dynamic and have an holistic evaluation. The outcome of that is that the redesign uh, touchpoint has delivered a better than expected digital sales. And it was also consistently rated better and more favorably than the prior the, the previous version. So to summarize, in summary, uh, what, what we have seen is that first of all, humans tend to have low tolerance for poor UX. It may or may not be a key driver, but it's almost always a strong barrier. In Ipsos, we really place humans at the heart of you know, this design process, this is really our approach and our DNA. So basically UX is really an essential tool uh, for all of you when uh, users interact with your product. This is really the connection point. I will hand over to Uber now to wrap up in this presentation. Uber, you are muted Uber. I think I was on mute. Sorry for that. Yes. So thank you, Stefan. So, you know, to conclude, do call us, you know, whenever you have like, uh, you know, to uh, a challenge, you know, to design from scratch or improve experiences in, in any of the following fields, you know, that you can see below, as you have seen through the, the case studies, we have a, a wealth of, of experience that we have been gathering over the, 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 the past years. And uh, we really want to, you know, to partner with you on this. Um, so with this in mind, and maybe you can move to the next slide. Yes, I would like to come back to, to the gift, like, uh, you know, Katarin mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, of this session, i.e., I mean, what, what we are offering is basically a, a two hour, you know, UX strategy workshop with you. The idea would be, you know, for, for, for us, you know, to partner and to brainstorm, you know, with you, thinking about some of the challenges you might be or questions that you might be facing in this, in this field. Uh, I think this is a real opportunity and we are keen to invest you know, time and brain power to, to help you as much as possible as we believe we have a lot you know, to bring on the, on the table. Um, so thanks again for your participation and, and interest, hoping you found you know, some inspiration during this, uh, you know, this uh, discussion. Now I see in the, in the chat that we had you know, several questions, so don't go away. I think we'd be able to answer still within the time frame uh, a few of them. Uh, and in case we can't go through all of them, which is very likely because it has been very active, we will follow up you know, individually with, with, with all of you to make sure that we get back to you on those, on those questions. So let me take maybe a first question. So what makes Ipsos UX you know, unique and better than other UX agencies? Um, okay, so, so maybe that's something I can I can take, uh, uh, not selfishly, but uh, because I think I can give you some, you know, some perspective. Uh, we alluded towards this, you know, before. I think we have developed like quite a, a lot of expertise. I mean, in this in this field, UX. On top of that, of course, you know, Ipsos is a global agency that can you know support you globally. But most importantly, we have this you know unique positioning that we can bring in you know different specialization different expertise 
to fully answer your business questions. And when I say, you know, different expertise, you know, you can think about like, you know, leveraging some of our experts in ethnography or in behavioral science or in customer experience to only name a few. So I would say these are for me what makes, you know, Ipsos unique compared to some of our competitors, the global coverage and this ability to mix, you know, real different expertise. A second question here that I can see. Um, any trends you have observed recently related to the UX practice? So maybe Damien, you would be best to answer this, if okay. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, so I mean, there, there's many trends that we're seeing. Um, I, I think probably two come to mind. So one is the, the rise in smart speakers. So obviously that they've, they've become prevalent now. Um, and what that sort of mean re meant really is that we've got a real acceleration in the use of voice. So I think I saw sort of a stat recently that it was 30% of all um, search every day is, is made up of voice search, which is quite a surprising stat and, and makes you realise the importance of starting to consider screenless interaction. So, you know, we have that tendency, to, I think, to think of websites and apps as just screen based. But actually, I think the trend that we're starting to see is that move beyond just the screen. So that's an interesting one. Um, and, the, and the other one's probably in the area of personalization. So uh, personalization, something that can sometimes be a little bit um, superficial and a, a little bit frivolous. But actually what we're seeing more now is uh, really tailoring the experience for um, and, and more, more the content and the pathways that somebody would go through based on somebody's previous interactions or maybe the products they bought or their, their kind of the context even. So the time of day, the location they're in. So I think that's probably something we're going to see much more of is that, you know, innovations around really tailoring the experience to the person. But there's so, there's so many different trends we could talk about and uh, maybe we should do a, another webinar on that. Thank you, Damien. So maybe the time for you know one more question. And uh, OK, let, let's pick this one, which I think is pretty interesting. So in which area do you see most demand requests you know, from your clients at the moment when it comes to UX? Uh, maybe Katarin, because you are in the in the center of, of our activities there, so you see quite a lot across the, the regions. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so we are having a lot of um, conversations with clients about UX, and Damien mentioned a couple of them that you know personalization and tailoring tailoring the solution to each user. Um, and we touched on some of them throughout the presentation, like um, reducing the friction in any user experience. But one that we, we seem to be getting quite a lot of is um, so looking at customer pain points in the user journey. So identifying what's the pain point um, and what's the common barrier. So quite often our clients come to us with data and they'll know what's happening. They'll know where the barriers to conversion exist, but they really need the UX perspective to understand what's happening and why users are behaving in certain ways. Um, so we're working with users to help our clients to undercover, uncover um, exactly what's happening at that point where there's a, a barrier to conversion and working with them to prototype and design experiences that um, reduce that friction really. Yeah. Thank you, Katarina. Good. So I think we are getting you know, towards the, the end of our session. So I'm going to, to close. I want to again, you know, thank you all for your participation and your interest into Ipsos and our webinars. Watch the space. I mean, there, there will be more coming until the end of the year. And uh, of course, I encourage you to take advantage of this, uh, you know, whatever we call gift. We are really keen, you know, to, to partner with you on this very new and, and exciting, you know, field. So, so looking forward to hearing from you and wishing you all uh, a good end of the afternoon. Thank you.